There's nothing better to introduce a landscape architect and a designer than through the work created. The oeuvre of our press center is impressive. A long list I won't read. It's available on the firm's website. The text refers to major achievements, prestigious recognitions and awards for the work. But it's a short list. I can't wait to see, to listen, and to be quiet, to enjoy the magic of the real. To borrow another word from Peter Suntor, I think the audience feels the same. I quote, we never decorate. Simplicity is complexity resolved, a quote from Constantine Brancusi in your book. Vision is the art of seeing things invisible. Jonathan Swift, also from your book, Visible, Invisible. In landscape architecture, we are familiar with the notion of gebaute Landschaften, borrowed landscape. Almost literally, an old view with origins in Asian Chinese garden composition. This concept found its way to Japan in Japanese garden architecture. It's called Shakai. I don't borrow a landscape, but I want to borrow a few words and sentences. Quote, to successfully build a fine work of landscape architecture is one of the most difficult tasks in the world of design. To master the challenges of climate, site, soils, drainage, plant selection, and the crafts of construction not to mention the challenges of financial, political, and aesthetic concerns, it's arduous. Success, therefore, is rare. Peter Walker, another quote. The tectonic clarity, quiet functionalism, and continuity that characterize their work are rooted in traditional values of the discipline, yet are hard to find in much of landscape practice today. Neil Kirkwood. And the last one, quote, the landscape art of their work is quiet and kind. Without demanding attention, it goes its way as if there could be no other. It is assured, utterly grounded in place and tradition, and calmly removed from the jangling mercurial design media world somewhere else out there. William Saunders. Gary Hildebrand is a founding principal and partner of Reed Hildebrand, a committed practitioner, teacher, critic, and writer. Gary is professor in practice at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where he has taught since 1990. Welcome, Gary Hildebrandt. Good morning. Thank you, Dean Mar. That's very kind. Uh, is the mic loud enough? It's okay? Great. Well, I have to say that um, there's good atmosphere here. <laughs> I like being in this conference. I've heard some very good talks. I will admit that um, I, I arrived just as Tom Fisher was beginning his talk. And he made me feel very conventional. <laughs> um, but yesterday I felt uh, maybe a little less conventional, and that's OK. Um, I'm happy to share uh, both teaching and uh, work with you. Mostly it's from teaching. Um, these are two worlds I inhabit. <clears throat> My studio on the left, in the middle of Central Square in Cambridge, with 50 people, and the trays, as we call them, at Harvard Design School, 900 students and 150 faculty all in one space, which is quite good. I want to say out front that 
All practices have to be spectac have to be speculative. Of course, you know all practices must be real. All schools must be real. And of course, you know they are speculative. I want the students to feel that after today's talk, if anyone says to you, well, wait till you get to the real world, you say back to them, my world is real. This world in this school is real. <laughs> and the consequences of the work for you while you're in this school are largely consequences that fall upon you. The consequences of work for my, felt my staff in practice fall upon me. And that's the difference. Both are real, the consequences change. Both are speculative, and if they ever aren't, then I'm leaving the field. I come, I teach in a school, I've been there 30 years, and I was there as a student before, which has been known, particularly in my field, but also in all three of the fields in the school, for really architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning, and urban design. We have been known for practitioners leading the way. The university has always been suspect of this, not surprisingly. We have um, just a few. Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. started the program 1900, 1899. Hideo Sasaki was a planner. Uh, he, had, he certainly had a landscape architecture degree, but we know him as a practitioner. He taught very effectively for a period of about eight years. And I curated an exhibition called The Sasaki Years at Harvard, um, in, in a way proving a, a beautiful reciprocity that he saw between teaching and practice. Essentially, because he had no lines, no, he had no teaching staff, he basically taught those years with his office staff. And uh, it's a marvel, actually, when you look at what they did. Peter Walker did sort of the same thing in the early 1980s. Laurie Olin in the mid-1980s. Laurie was the chair when I was a student. I learned a lot from him. Linda Jewell. There's a much longer list. Um, they include Michael Van Valkenburg, George Hargreaves, uh, and so on. And that tradition is something that I feel desperately needs to be kept up. Our students come from the country, largely. And one of the jobs I feel I have is to make them urbanists. Now, what do urbanists do? Uh, in these two slides, I think I can tell you that, on the one hand, with the Bachman lithograph, which is merely a description of New York City in uh, just a period just after the Civil War, it is a descriptive of the commercial and economic situation of the island of Manhattan, which is just beginning to be connected to Brooklyn, the city of Brooklyn. You can see the Brooklyn Bridge. And this is description. So one of our tasks, clearly, is description. We saw very good, very good um, examples of description yesterday. Then urbanists also must be speculative. And 50 years later, given that by 1910, the Pennsylvania Railroad had essentially connected to Manhattan Island and moved through it to Brooklyn and beyond. Commerce exploded. This enabled fantastic growth for Manhattan and for the New York City itself. And so by 1922, the Regional Plan Association is having to be very speculative about what is the future of the metropolis, right? So the urbanist has to see the world for its real conditions and must also speculate on what we must do, we have to imagine what we must do in order to make a sustainable and healthy city. <clears throat> this is my first trip to Winnipeg. 
I think Winnipeg is fantastic because of this urban canopy. And I focus a lot of my work on a tree cover in cities. And I have not seen a stand of American elms here because you can't see one anywhere but here. 270,000 American elms. You have a North American treasure in their city. And I hope you're doing something good about it. When you look closer into downtown, you don't see the benefit of that continuous canopy, right? And so I'm showing this because I'm fascinated by it, and I will come back here because our work on the Cambridge Urban Forest Canopy Plan and in other cities has led me to be deeply concerned about how we maintain connective vegetation and soils management in the heart of the downtown of our city. It's the only way we can ever say we could have a healthy city. Until we do that, our city isn't really a healthy city. Now, my firm's work is widely known. You know that we work at many scales. We work in the country. We work in the suburbs. Not so much, but we work in the suburbs. We do things of very fine scale and fine detail. We work on very big mansions, like this one by Sir Edward Lechens in uh, Berkshire in the UK. We here have actually done the very real work of restoring a grade one listed building and its, its gardens. But we've at the same time had to be massively speculative about the plantings because we had no evidence of the Jekyll plantings. We don't even have proof that Gertrude Jekyll worked there. We know about the collaboration, this is widely known, we know about the plant palette generally. We know it at, about things that we could say are attitudinal, but we were really in the role, the realm of conjecture when working on something like that. On the other hand, restoring the very steep chalk banks and covering them with wildflower meadows, we knew we had photographic evidence of that direct condition. They had been kind of worn down over the years and we put that back with chalk and uh, so they're a combination of a very real kind of effort that's conservation-like, uh, and then also a speculation. Um, we've worked at things like uh, 16 years for the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown in the Berkshires. Uh, and um, I'll speak about this a little bit later, but I'm devoting a lot of time right now to a massive uh, redevelopment of the waterfront and uh, um, Central Business District of Tampa, Florida. About 15 years ago, in te teaching a studio with students on South Boston, because I became interested in the canopy, in the role of the canopy, and because I was having to build urban canopy in my urban projects, I sent my students off on a couple of research questions, and I learned only then, this is really 14 or 15 years ago, there's a vast science of urban forestry that our tax dollars are paying for, which is producing a massive amount of information that landscape architects seemed not to know about. I didn't. I thought I was fairly knowledgeable. And so with all of the data that's produced, much of it not easy to read and not well illustrated, we began to say, let's, let's represent this, and let's spatialize this data, let's understand it. And I, in, a, in a snapshot, really, what I learned in that semester is that the urban foresters in the United States and elsewhere, Germany in particular, but it's true in Spain, it's true in some cities in South America, the urban foresters have been producing better arguments than we have for what we do. And this was revolutionary for me. I started to get my students to focus on everything around the urban tree canopy. And we discovered, for instance, in the Therda plan of the late 19th century in Barcelona, if you just draw the 54,000 London planes, you understand the structure of the city. 
How beautiful is that? Most of them are still there. It's astonishing. Or they've been replaced. 54,000 within three decades. The London plane happens to be the biggest performer for the urban canopy. It has the largest leaves of any hardwood, any northern hardwood, and therefore it captures the most rainfall. Its leaves are coarse, which means that the water will wash off the particulates that land on the leaf. Its root structure will take compaction. It will take soil, uh, it'll take the salts in the soil. Um, it'll grow in very little soil. If you drive a car into it, the car will go away, the tree will stay. The car never wins when you hit a London plane. And you can pave right up to its nose, and it will survive. And so this is something remarkable. Now, anybody who knows forestry today <clears throat> will tell you that's way too many of one species. We can't do that. That's not diverse enough. Well, they survive so well, I think we should do it. I think we should have 270,000 American elm trees in every city in North America. So we talk a lot about performance, but with my students and with my clients, I never want to talk about performance without talking also about the ephemeral and phenomenological and spatial aspects of the canopy. So I force my students to take photographs. Tell me what this is like spatially. I know you can be interested and compelled by their performance characteristics. That's not enough. I can say that as a youngster growing up near New York City, I became fascinated with trees. And I also felt for a very long time that as I think maybe many of you do, artists tend to lead the way for us. And having grown up in the Hudson Valley and understood what a massive scenic culture was embedded in the Hudson Valley because of a culture of artists in the 19th century, I've also been drawn to understanding a way of seeing the city through nature, which is beautifully embodied by these photographs of uh, Edward Steichen on the left, Alfred Stieglitz on the right, four years apart, 1902-1906. <clears throat> Two very different ways to see and celebrate uh, the kind of metropolis through New York's favorite building at the time, the Flatiron Building. But these aren't photographs of the Flatiron Building. They're photographs of a city which is engaged in nature. And I've always loved the Ajay photographs, <clears throat> which document this amazing relationship to tree canopy that we know characterizes the center of Paris. And so when confronted with urban projects like the Central Wharf, sort of in the middle years of our practice, because our practice really had started on residential and institutional work, and we now get large urban commissions, I didn't really know how to do that, and I did at the time learn about ecosystem services and urban forestry and soil science. And so we combined those bits of knowledge to produce that, and we came up with a kind of formation. It goes something like this. If you want the performative and spatial aspects of a tree canopy in the city, anybody not want that? No. We can cool the city up to 20 degrees in Arizona with tree cover. We can intercept 40% or more of rainfall in this plaza. We, we intercept 100% of rainfall. It does not go off site. We can store 58 gallons of rainfall in a tree. We can sequester 13 pounds of carbon in a tree, right, very quickly. Uh, we can absorb ozone, we can take up particulates. We can't do that if the tree dies within 13 years, which is very typical for trees in the dense 
downtowns of our North American cities. But if we provide a system of life support, which means about 1,300 cubic feet of soil per tree, think about that. You see trees planted in four feet by four feet by two feet. Can you do the math? 32 cubic feet. Don't do it. Don't plant when that's the condition. You want more than 1,000 cubic feet. And you need permeability in order to keep that alive. 25% of that soil has to be aerated constantly. That means permeability. The paving has to support loading. That's obvious. And you have to irrigate trees for three years or you just don't get started. So all of this is about the nutrient exchange which nature provides in forests and which we must provide in the urban forest. If we don't do that, let's just not bother. Um, we're serious enough about this to have done our own self-funded research project on uh, the work that we'd done in the previous 10 years, building manufactured soils in urban conditions. We took a, an arborist uh, from uh, the, the Morton Arboretum, and we devised with him a kind of register of tree health, kind of a shorthand for whether a tree was in good condition or not. Uh, we took a soil scientist, uh, and he, gave, he, put, he gave, made borings in our soil. The question was, 10 years later, or 20 years later, or with the Sasaki project even, 30 years later, did the soils look like, and did they perform like they were specified to do so? And we had pretty good results on the kind of soil we use, which is sand-based structural soil. We had pretty poor results on CU soil. If you know what CU soil is, it was developed at Cornell University in New York. And it's largely composed of gravel, which does not compact, which leaves wide pores for nutrient exchange to happen. What we really found was that some of the minerals and ions required for nutrient exchange were bound to the gravel and not available for the microbiology to interact with them. So a whole set of interactions which is necessary for um, taking the sugars that the tree produces, breaking them down and making them available again to be brought back up into the tree, not happening. So we, we found that poorer health and certainly less uh, microbiotic activity below grade. So we've shared this online. We have um, talked about it in conferences and so on. It's given us a kind of confidence in the soil that we use, and we're still evolving how the details work and so on. Turning now to a subject which is taking up a whole lot of brain power right now, which is the recognition that our city streets take up about 50% of our cities. You aware of that? About 50% of our cities are paved. When streets weren't differentiated, that is to say when they didn't have like walks in the, in the side and then curbs and you know, buses and trucks and cars in the middle, that was one kind of world, but for 100 years, a hundred years, our streets have been the province of traffic planners. And they have essentially been binary in their organization. About 10% dedicated to people on foot, the rest to things uh, with motors. And if we're predicting that we will have fewer cars, and we'd better be right about that, we have to be right about that. If we're, if we're going to mitigate climate change, that's one of the ways we're going to do it. And I'm positive about that. What are we going to do with all that space? So this has become a real preoccupation for me in my practice and also in my teaching. What are we going to do to reprioritize the street? 
Bernie Sabat photograph from 1936 on the left. You can see the chaos emerging in New York. A recent photograph in New York as well. You can see the chaos. Over the last 10 years, especially with the Bloomberg administration in New York, we've begun to see the light on our streets. And Jeanette Sadiq Khan had the guts and the intelligence to start taking part of the street back. Now, she did it largely without permits, without fighting the traffic engineers, because she called it temporary. It's pretty smart. These are like beta testing the reprioritization of the surface of the street. Once you do this for bicyclists, they will have their hands around your neck because this is the only safe way to bicycle through the city. Give it dedicated space. They're right about that. And in Times Square, she did get the permits. And people were completely upset. You know what the cab drivers thought? You're going to take traffic off Broadway? I'm going to have to go down 7th and make a left? I can't do it. Don't do that to me. They did it. I think they did it beautifully. Hats off to Snow Hetta. My friends at Snow Hetta have done something really amazing here. I have said then to my students, since three consecutive studios, this is real. Let's speculate. I've taken them every time to show them the detail and so on. Uh, I've had friends at Snow had to tell them how hard it was to get this done. I'm trying to do it in Boston with Studio Gang, this Jeannie Gang's tower. We have just three weeks ago gotten approval for this project. We're now getting the rezoning next week. And believe it or not, we are taking traffic off Commonwealth Avenue, arguably New York, uh, Boston's most important street, and turning it round. We're making a kind of vortex here. We're making a flat iron site where a building doesn't exist and where there's really no public realm. We'll produce nearly an acre of plaza for the public realm, and we will create maybe the most iconic location for a building in the city. This has taken two years. Um, traffic guys love it. Those neighbors don't. But this is, this is where we're working. We are reprioritizing the street. We're not taking it away. You can still see down the street. It's just that the cars have to make a couple of hundred feet of extra movement. Now, in New York, they've already accepted the idea that waiting times for drivers can be longer than they are today. In Boston, not so. Not yet. That will change. That will change. <clears throat> and we're doing this also in Tampa. And in Tampa, uh, we are on um, about, let's say, 35% construction of the first phase. It's a $3.4 billion first phase of work. We are working now to plan the third phase. That will be another $3 billion. Uh, this is a self-funded project, so there's no um, worries about getting funding. Um, the owner of the hockey team has enough money to do this, along with his partner, Bill Gates. And so we are literally transforming 20 blocks of downtown Tampa. And we're creating a six block long street that has 96, about 160 live oak trees with a huge commitment to the soil that's required to do so. Um, now, I have it on good authority, a guy named Vitruvius, that architects should, and I should say urbanists, landscape architects, planners, geographers, everybody who can work as an epidemiologist in the city 
should also have knowledge of the study of medicine on account of questions of climate, air, the healthiness and unhealthiness of sites, and the use of different waters. 2,000 years ago, we were told that we have to understand public health. And I'm saying to you that working in the public realm and building a healthy city is the work of our time. I am completely convinced of this. Um, this project in Tampa is the first neighborhood to be designated as meeting the well standard. If you don't know about that, I would look it up. But unlike other rating systems, this one considers air quality, water and water storage and water availability, nourishment and whether food is available, how far you have to walk to a grocery, light, fitness, whether there are classes nearby, temperature, sound, how loud is the street, materials, mind, mindfulness, community and innovation. Pretty good system. This is how we're going to evaluate whether our work is any good. And these are all public realm matters, right? The buildings have to behave. The public realm has to be very smart and healthy. Um, and I'm proud that um, recently, if you saw the exhibition, Our Happy Life at the CCA in Montreal, um, we were uh, included, along with projects in Tokyo and Copenhagen, as predicting this role for healthfulness in designing cities. They called me and said, we want you to be in an exhibition called Our Happy Life. I said, what? <laughs> do I really want to do that? But when they explained it to me, I thought, yeah, that's a good thing. We put our, they wanted our drawings of soil. I thought, okay, I'm in now. You'll, I'll do whatever you like. And so we literally showed them our planting details for Tampa in which we are getting 1,300 cubic feet per tree. It's expensive to do that. And we had these light boxes made with the species that we're using also. <clears throat> okay, now to the studio work. The first of three studios was called Broadway Shuffle at Madison Square. You, you know that um, the Times Square is a bow tie. Broadway is a long diagonal, and when the commissioner's grid of 1811 moved uptown with key doubly wide streets at 14th, 23rd, uh, 34th, 42nd, um, 6th, 57th, 57th, and so on. Uh, at those streets, we made these awkward intersections. We call them bow ties. Times Square is the most famous one. Madison Square is another really good one. And they tend to have parks because of their, the irregularity of, and, and it, it, it set a, a, a system of kind of points and nodes along the grid. And this is one of the places where Jeanette Sadiq Khan and her army of um, people with paint cans and chairs and planters had kind of temporarily reorganized traffic. I said to the students, what if we made an actual investment in the public realm here, what would it look like? How do we reprioritize the street and say we are making a vast improvement in the public realm? That was studio number one. The second one was another bow tie. There's a good example of a bow tie at Lincoln Center. And I said to the students, okay, New York City has just spent a billion dollars to upgrade the facilities in Lincoln Center. And they're wonderful. You know, I, Lincoln Center happens for me to be the most beautiful space in the city of New York. Uh, they did something in the 1960s which we would never do today, which is to consolidate 11 cultural institutions on one campus. It makes no sense the way we live today to do that. But, and it also, forced 8,000 people to move who, who didn't have affordability to move. There's a big downside to Lincoln Center. 
But I love to go there at dusk because people are strutting and it's really like the only place in North America to see a passeggiata. Okay, we spent a billion dollars under Liz Diller to fix this place. Why, why didn't some of that get put into the public realm alongside Lincoln Center? Why do I have to walk across 13 lanes of traffic to go to the opera? I don't think it's going to be that way much longer. Let's take a look at that. And then the third one, and each of these is increasingly more speculative, right? It's rooted in real stuff, but it's also really speculative. The third one was now arriving a, Mat a Manhattan transit landscape, and I'll explain it, but it was essentially about erasing Penn Station, since Penn Station is a horrible thing to begin with. Now, it, when I teach these studios, I say to the students, we will be data driven, but our work will not look like data. This is an issue I have in just about every program I go to. I believe that if your, stu if your teachers are researchers, it's very likely that their students' work will look like research, and I want it to look like design. And so we'll, we'll be data driven, but we won't look like data. We will never talk about performance without talking about spatiality. I want you to think telescopically. I want you to understand something the size of a paver and what the impact of the shape of that paver is in the neighborhood and in the world. Telescopic thinking. I mentioned I want to turn landscape architects into urbanists. That's not automatic. They don't come that way. But if they're going to be good professionals, they must be urbanists. And I have a lot of friends in New York, and so it's easy also to introduce my students to a culture there. And you know, there's just so much work. If you are thinking about climate these days, and if you're not, I don't know what you're thinking about, um, you need to read that book. That book by Halperin was written in 1964 as a kind of report to the New York City Housing Authority, we call that NYCHA today, about how to transform projects like Reese Houses, Peter Stuyvesant Village, which were seen as already failing because their public realms were falling apart. And Halpern said, it's the weather. What can we do to change the microclimate here? Beautiful study. And we also have to be constantly aware that the neoliberal infusion of capital in and what includes you know, a whole lot of empty apartments that go for staggering sums of money so they, people can park their money. This isn't contributing to a better city either. Hudson Yards is not making New York City better. It's not. Anyway, with, with that as context, we kind of launched our, our studios. So here you have Madison Square. That's Union Square, didn't use that one. Madison Square. Lincoln Center, and then Penn Station right there. Yeah, right there. Broadway's fascinating, right? Broadway is known as a great street by probably 60% of the people who live on the face of the earth, right? Well, name, a big, name a great street and it's not really. I mean, it's not a very good street. We have, you know, we have nice history. You know, I've asked the students to, let's say, let's say, what's it like? What is street life like on, on that? And then, um, what would it be like if we said that the subway platforms were open to the sky and that the subway platform was accessible to everyone, whether you were on wheels or uh, with a cane or you, whether you couldn't see well? and maybe you could grow a mushroom culture on the top of that roof. So this was a project to make a reflective surface above you, which would, from the street, actually show you the platform and you could even see the train, and so on. So we were thinking about transit and street life and so on. With the Lincoln Center project, as I said, spend a billion dollars there, why not? What if, what if we spent 100 million on the streets? What would it be like to reconfigure the streets? to get rid of at least some of those 16 lanes of traffic. Here's another project that opens up 
the subway to the sky, connects Lincoln Center from the subway platform all the way through to arrival. I mentioned that, you know, we start with a project that looks at what I feel is a very underutilized tool that we can thank Stan Allen for, which is field condition. Draw me a field condition, and then I will draw you a city. That field condition can come from anything. You can make a geometry from data. You can make a geometry from the geometry that surrounds you. You can make geometry from a photograph of a site. And then what I ask the students to do is to come to me, I say this on Thursday, come back to me on Wednesday with a shape that could be used, deployed throughout, and that maybe we can break the code. The code today is a concrete sidewalk, a granite curb or a steel curb, an asphalt roadway, and white stripes and tiger teeth. That's the code of the city street. Well, could we make that different? Could we make the sidewalk out of something else? Could it be permeable? Why not? Could we still make the, the crosswalk something you would expect? So let me say this about crosswalks. They were, uni they were uni unified as a language in 1964, I think. If you stand in a crosswalk the way the Beatles did on the cover of Abbey Road, you're fairly secure. It's not likely that you will be hit by a car, right? That's a code. Why not change that code? Let's make another code that keeps you safe. In any case, this was a really fun thing. What if the street were full of patterns and then, but there was one pattern in particular that you knew would allow you to be safe in crossing the street. Another pattern which would indicate where you can park. And by the way, this pattern should have an obligation to produce areas for drainage and for soil and for aeration and for planting and for stuff that we have to put on the street. We could design, and this is what Snow Hatta did, I think, very well in, the, in Times Square. So after two studios like that, I thought, okay, I just got to get more speculative with the students. Um, we knew that Madison Square Garden has only about two more years on its lease. The Dolan family has been told by the New York City authorities that they're going to have to get out in two years. It's not going to happen. But some people believe that it would. Maybe not in two years. Maybe they'll get an extension, but Madison Square Garden is going to go away. Why is that important? Because it unlocks a vast opportunity for New York. It used to be beautiful to arrive at New York by steamship. Arriving at the Statue of Liberty. Arriving in a grand hall. Driving over the Brooklyn Bridge, beautiful. Walking over the Brooklyn Bridge, beautiful. Landing in Penn Station, inspiring and amazing. Where the track is open to the sky. And you hear a guy with a megaphone call your train. And I don't want to just be nostalgic about that. I think that is something we could return to. That, that train station lasted 50 years. And in its place, they put a money machine called Madison Square Garden. By the 40s, transit already didn't have a very high aspiration for the architecture that should contain it and control it. And arriving by car today in New York, not pretty. It's just not that pretty. But a lot of people do that. OK, so in 1964, they took down that beautiful station and they put up a, a piggy bank. And let me tell you, that thing spends a lot of money. And they relegated the station to there, right? Money above, people here. Vincent Scully said, 
You used to arrive in New York City like a prince or a king. Now you scuttle in like a rat. 650,000 people a day use this station. 650, that's like every person in Winnipeg. <laughs> every day, twice. And I don't know if you know it, but it is hellacious. But you know, there's the money machines. Like, isn't that a piggy bank? This is what the experience of Penn Station is every day. Horrible. And one of the problems, if you're riding Amtrak, which is like something like 25% of the users, because there are not enough tracks under the Hudson coming eastbound, they can't predict which, which track your train will be on until it just about is in the station. And so you know, if you've been in Penn Station and want to get, get to Washington or, or Boston, everyone is like this, like this, watching that sign and then rushing to the track so they can get a seat in the quiet car. And why are we treating people like this? Because Chris Christie killed the third tunnel coming from New Jersey. Well, that tunnel will be built someday. And when it is, your phone will tell you what track you're going to be on a half an hour before. You won't even have to go to the station. And then you don't need all of that crummy retail. We've got to fix the subways, which are you know, in terrible shape. You know, the best guy we've ever had run the system just quit because he got in a fight with the governor. There's just a lot of, a lot of problems here, right? But there's a lot of hope. This guy and his company, Bornado, owns 8 million square feet surrounding Penn Station. Now, if you think he doesn't think Penn Station's going to change, you haven't thought too hard about it. 8 million square feet. So there have been plans, right? Bjarke Engels has you know, tried to say we could put a new skirt on a building. Uh, this is famous. I mean, when I think this is when um, Olympia and York were the owners of Hudson Yards. Um, I think through the ages of uh, Phyllis Lambert, uh, there was a competition. This is Jesse Reiser's version. This is Tom Main's version. I don't think these ever really dealt with the public realm. And we said, if you're really going to change this place, and if Madison Square Garden is really going to go, what could it be like? We, they have moved the, the Amtrak station into uh, the Farley building across the street, that's a good move. Um, the governor has just said that they're going to buy the block between 31st and 32nd so that they can go to work on the platforms that would be used if, in the eventuality that we'll have a third harbor tunnel uh, and so on. What I said to the students was, let's speculate on what it would mean if you no longer had Madison Square Garden here, and if you had technology in your pocket that would tell you where your train was going to be, and you didn't have to go buy a pizza and sit in a waiting room. And so we said, what, it, what would it mean to have the largest plaza in New York City here? This is a crossroads. And so this is a version where you would have had a forest, and you could just kind of go down, at whatever track you are, and get on the train. This was one of lifting the plaza to create a kind of shed, train shed, and getting people down very quickly. This was one which dealt with light. In my studios, if you're going to make something like this, you're going to tell me how it drains, and how it has soil, and how it has shade. OK, so it's speculative, but it's very real. Could we have a set of glass boxes? And this is the new code. This code comes from a photograph of shadows on this site. And so the beginning point for these field condition studies, to me, is completely arbitrary. You can take data. You can take shadows. And then you can build a world out of those. Uh, <clears throat> this one is a kind of. Mm, I think uh, this, 
Another version of this was entered into the 1985-83 competition at La Villette. This is, this is kind of revisiting the issue of palimpsest. And the student really wanted to do it, and I was happy to, you know, kind of accelerate her through that. Um, in the end, we were able to make an exhibition. Um, here's Penn Station, right? Here's the Hudson Yards, maybe another way. Here's the, the wharves and so on. Um, <clears throat> Uh, a, a really great topic. Um, and so I think by the time of the end of this studio, these students really all loved the city. Um, just so I don't make you think I'm only working on that, every landscape architect works on coastal sites or on rivers. And that means that Every site we work on is changing dramatically in the very next few years. And so um, we are very currently asked to reimagine what would happen to the tidal basin in the monumental core of Washington, D.C. Why? Because the land is subsiding, the sea is getting higher, portions of the perambulus perambulation around this basin are already underwater twice a day. Some of the 27,000 cherry trees that are a very important attraction to Washington are already in standing water twice a day and dying because of it. And you have five significant memorials that are cumulatively about the expression of freedom in America. And our relationship to these memorials must change because this basin is falling in, it's failing. And so we have a very interesting thing. There are five firms, um, my firm, Field Operations, Gustus and Guthrie Nickel, Walter Hood, and uh, Susanna Drake have been invited, not for a design competition, but for an ideas forum where we are working together. On next Thursday, we are showing each other our first phase of work. I've never participated in anything like this. But if we're gonna solve the kind of issues that are here, this is a pretty good way to start. We're not starting with the Park Service's constraints about preservation. We're starting in another place with a nonprofit who doesn't have the Park Service to worry about. So we are working on Health, we are urban epidemiologists. We are trying to make a healthy public realm. And I wanna to say to the students, this is a fantastic time to go into this field because the opportunities are mind boggling. Thank you. Thank you so many groupings. I want to introduce all these cousins. Amanda Reyes. She graduated from our program in 2018, that's right. And I know that when she was in our program, she was always eager to practicing a site. So she got early experience in professional practice. Then, on a short note, Neil Minyok agreed to be on the podium. I got an email from him, from him last evening, so he's sick, he has to do. So maybe we are lucky that he's not here today. So it, it was a very short note. So I was looking around, and I was asking Kim first, and Kim was pointing out to Chris, he's an architect as well. I guess you are graduated from this school as well, That's right. am I right? Yeah. And now we are working for and with Tom Montaigne yeah. since how long? Uh, uh, going on 10 years. 10 years. So it's great. Two architects and the landscape architect. Uh, we will talk about next school. I think next school, the space. After school, and maybe after school is next school. So I think it's an ongoing process of learning. First of all, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation.
So the last few days we heard a lot about you know smart cities and so on. I feel that you are actually started to touch the soul of the city. I'm not really sure if cities actually have a soul, but for me, you know, that speaks to my heart. You are touching the soul of the city. You no know, thinking on different scales at the same time, how people might influence the neighborhood, might influence the city and uh, the urban we are. And you were talking about specifications. So maybe my question for all of you would be, and you started with that, you know, you introduced teachers. And here a short list. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, Walter Kropius, Lionel Feinio, Johannes Gitten, Vasily Kandinsky, Paul Klee, Laszlo Morinari, Oscar Schlemmer, architects, painters, sculptors, educators, graphic designers, photographers, town planners, historians, textile artists, and so on. Bauhaus teachers, well known in experts in their film, in their uh, uh, discipline. My question maybe for all of you and maybe for the students, how would you specify your teachers for the next school? <clears throat> I have a mic. Um, I love your list. I want Annie Albers. I, I know I was a <laughs> <the> short list. <laughs> um, I think I, 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 I love the pedagogy of um, Paul Clay. I'm probably better at looking back than looking ahead. Um, but if we, uh, let's say that you know, the, the, those teachers you cited produce a kind of ethos that is not discipline bound, right? It's extra disciplinary. And this is essential, it's crucial. I do find that in their final year of graduate school, when I ask the students to look at Annie Albers, because you will find a way to break the paving code there. They don't know Annie Albers. This is shocking. Um, when I ask them to look at color field painting, because I want them to like take away, take away, take everything away, and leave something potent and powerful. They don't know Ellsworth Kelly. They don't know Richard Diebenkorn. Why is that? Why have we stopped teaching that? So my school of the future has all of those really important people. Uh, I said yesterday, I think, uh, in response to a question uh, on someone else's panel, that at the same time, um, it used to be very hard to draw a river. Very hard to draw a system of rivers or a watershed on paper with pens or you know pencils, three fourteen pencils. Um, it's not hard to draw a river now, right? So we also have to have the technologists that we heard from yesterday, um, in equal measure, let's say, right? We need the geographers and the digital masters as much as we need your isn that's my school. I'm not going anywhere else. I feel just add to that, Dimar, the, um, the people that you mentioned all have a really strong artistic identity. And I think that that is something that is strong about the most successful designers. So I guess, what is your artistic identity as a landscape architect? And how do you implement that in your professional practice and teaching? Yeah. <clears throat> I think that the world, I wish that everyone in the world understood what it means to have an artistic practice. It means you are an investigative person. 
and you are seeking expression. But it's not about painting how I feel. And that's what the world seems to think it is still today, right? If I have an artistic identity, it is my analytical frame of mind. I want to know what's in that bottle. I want to know how the bottle was made. I want to know why it's shaped that way. And this is Giorgio Mirandi. Um, I want to know what it looks like when I aggregate four or five bottles together. Do, do I find meaning in that? I want to know what the shape of the ground is, and I want to know what's underneath that, what's forming that shape. I would say that's my artistic practice. It's asking, 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 and every now and then giving expression to something. Or like Cezanne. Cezanne could, you know, struggle deeply, right? I mean, we know he struggled very deeply because he felt that he could paint the vase a thousand ways. But the painting had to embody one of those, and it was crushing for him. And that struggle, that, that was his artistic expression. And I think we have that struggle in design. We draw it and again and again and again and again, and iteration is a part of that artistic enterprise. I don't call myself an artist, I do believe it though. And would you say that's how you're trying to achieve that in your teaching pedagogy with students? It's the very same. I, I want to see I want to see you do this. Show me five versions tomorrow. Investigate. Tell me what the words are that describe that. Why is that Donald Judd thing useful? And so, uh, you know, I, I think Tom, Tom the other night, uh, Tom Fisher uh, had a diagram that stuck with me nicely. Science is truth, humanities is meaning, design is what might it be like. Uh, I like that. It's kind of reductive and simple, but uh, it stuck with me. I want to know about truth. Can't do anything without it. Can't do anything without science. I want to know about why it's meaningful. I want the student to tell me why it's meaningful, and then we can have an imaginary. So yeah, it's the same in the office as it is in the school for me. This is why it's, it's worthwhile to lead a double life. It's hard, but it's worthwhile. Uh, I do appreciate your attending to describing the thing for prescribing pers the solution. Um, the depth of understanding and understanding the, the condition as it is other than the thing as it, as it could be or as it ought to be, yeah. and that, that would come. Yes. But uh, that would be putting a cart before the horse. Yes. And that's the thing that we've all suffered in, by that in, in our yeah. urban situations, you know, where, wherever we come from, sort of this play of fantasy or sort of this, this yeah. aspiration without understanding. Um, I was somewhat struck by how infrastructural <laughs> the realm of your work is. Um, I wasn't quite sure where you're, where you're going. So I, I, on the one hand, uh, at the beginning of your lecture, I was thinking, um, I was reflecting on a, a site that I visited a few years ago in Chicago. Uh, it's the uh, IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology, um, uh, the, the student center there. Um, yeah. The uh, uh, OMA, had a landscape strategy where they 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 seeded um, the, the the territory, not knowing what would take root. There's something about that that appeals to me because you're not describing. Alternatively, though, th there's something about it that that maybe doesn't acknowledge the understanding of what ought to be taken, what the thing should be. And it seems to me you don't have that luxury in, in what you do. You describe the time scale and the calculus required to have a successful outcome, and 
and to be cavalier or casual or to sort of, to have it be, um, sort of uh, fluid or flexible uh, doesn't seem to be an option. Yet, we have a, a set of environmental conditions that we need to be able to adapt to and respond to. Uh, so I'm quite curious how you, you manage that. Yeah. I appreciate the question. I, I would say, you know, that we, we don't get asked to participate in urban commissions where someone is looking to brand space. We can't succeed in that. Mm -hmm. We will fail. We will collapse on ourselves. But, you know, a lot of our competitors don't have to name names, come in pretty fast with like lots of gizmos, lots of um, expressive device. And for us, it has to come really from a deeper analytical reading of site and condition. And that takes time. And um, we can't show that in an interview. So we don't. And we will lose in those cases when, you know, alongside us, there'll be an interview which say, here's what's going to look like, you're going to love it, before they've even spoken with somebody about what the nature of the problem really is. So uh, we're like slow food in that way. Yeah, and, it, and, and it's, it, it is an, inhibit it's, it's an inhibition, uh, given the circumstances of how much one has to compete and how much you have to show your hand in order to get significant commissions. So, did you, did you presumably then you're working with uh, sort of more of a governmental level or a, 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 a robust uh, organizational type of, type of client base? I think our, um, we work a lot with developers. And, you know, the best developers, we're choosy about that, but the best developers that we've been working with, Tishman Spire and a few others, um, see the benefit of digging deeply. Um, others don't. Some, I mean, you know, we, we'll, we'll be working and somebody will come in as a financial partner and then we'll have to go because we're not doing fun. Um, but I have to say that developers are, are, is one place where, in the Tampa project, I mean, we don't have any fun in our work at Tampa. We have a very seriously planted, healthy public realm, which has taken you know, quite a few years to evolve. Um, but the other place where we really get pretty good rope is with cultural institutions, the art museums, which are, which are already inclined to think the way we think because they, they know that they embody and they are the stewards and the curators of great cultural meaning. And they are all, usually already positioned to understand that their landscape can also accrue cultural meaning. Not always, but quite often. And so we do bring a certain uh, kind of institution building to a place like that. Like Thinking of your landscape, and the, and the Clark Art Institute is really kind of a big paradigm here. Thinking of your landscape as, as a part of your, co of your collections. This is your living collections. And so you can go to the Clark, which has w one of the great private collections of 19th century painting in North America. And you experience these incredible works of landscape and portraiture and decorative arts, but there are some fantastic landscapes. And you leave this building and you are in that landscape again. It used to be a parking lot. And now it's a big reflection and a sky and a massive um, meadow up a hill. So uh, the cultural institutions also, uh, if they don't come ready for it, they come with kind of the preparation of mind or the habit of mind to be able to listen and to gradually see immense value in their landscape. Great to work with museums. Perhaps it's because they're open to risk as well. So 
Yeah. 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 Yeah, campuses and cities tend to be more risk averse. Um, so it seems that, at least in part, and the transition from the speculative to the real uh, comes from some sort of interdisciplinary exchange of knowledge and uh, collaboration. So I was wondering yeah. if you could collaborate, if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on the role of collaboration in relationship to the speculative and the real, in relationship to your professional practice and teaching that environment. Yeah, yeah, surely. Um, I mean, as a, for instance, we we have um, right now begun to work on the commission to. Uh, master plan the rehabilitation of one of Olmsted's greatest works, Franklin Park in Boston. Uh, we built our team to capture the project that was competitive um, by saying that we were going to be the prime. We have 15 sub-consultants. We have two primary subs. One is a firm called Agency, which is really built around public engagement. The methodologies of, of engaging with constituencies and stakeholders. We don't do that well because that's not what we love. Um, and increasingly, you must do this in the public realm. And then we also brought in Michael Murphy of Mass Design because they too have um, really great, beautiful experience in working with the local and bringing the project up out of the local. So it's a sort of a triumvirate. And then we have, you know, we have economics people, we have pu a public health person, we have our soil scientists, our arborists, our, our engineers, and so on. So it's 15 firms plus us. And this is a kind of the way we have to work. Um, oh, we have it, and Mass Design is, an arch is the architect on the project. It's increasingly the case. So 70% of our work, more than 70% of our revenues come from projects where we are the prime. Often the architects are, are, are sub to us now. And sometimes we are asked even to do the architect selection. So the problem structures have changed. They become kind of larger. And um, I think you know, this period where we went through something called landscape urbanism really perhaps turned the tables a bit. The big important questions that are being asked, I think, um, you know, my friend, colleague Charles Waldheim likes to say the landscape architect is the urbanist of our time, but surely not alone. <laughs> the urbanist of our time. If you think about the horizontality of the public realm of the city, where do we have to work the most? On the landscape. Um, in school, I have to bring in, if I'm working on the, a coastal situation, I bring in Jesse Keenan, who is one of our country's great experts on the law around sea level rise. Right? Uh, so that, that's really not much different. Um, have to expose the students to, in Tom Fisher's diagram, the truth, or the closest we can get to the truth, uh, and then also the speculative. Um, so uh, no project isn't collaborative anymore. Um, but in the student work, is it collaborative in the interdisciplinary sense? Do you also engage other? other uh, faculties or departments? Uh, depends on the circumstance. Um, the Penn Station project, I had three architects and nine landscape architects. Uh, four of those landscape architects had uh, um, architectural backgrounds. That was very helpful in that studio. <coughs> but because th these studios become very popular, I tend to get MLA students. So that limits it a bit. I surely bring in um, my architect friends for reviews. But I'm, you know, sometimes it's limited. You have 13 weeks and you know, so on. So it's guest appearances more than full collaborations, just by circumstance. 
Surely in our core studios, there's lots of engagement with the other disciplines. And in some of the coursework, like in professional practice, there are true overlaps um, between architecture and landscape architecture in the school. So. I'm timeless, but I got a signal from JB only to the floor. Oh, you have a mic already? Okay, feel free to ask a question or comment. Um, hi, um, sorry this question is a bit off topic, but right now in my first year of environmental design schooling, um, we've sort of discussed ecology and design and like resilience in mind when designing. And one thing we kind of touched on in our course, and I'm curious on your opinion and your thoughts on the argument around land sharing versus land sparing as a conservation tool within cities. And also, as a landscape architect in a larger city, I'm wondering if you've been confronted with this issue and if it's a continuous rising issue. Can you explain it to me? Um, how, how do you mean exactly land sharing? Um, like uh, trees and um, uh, vegetation kind of spread out within the city instead of being condensed into one area. Mm -hmm. I have two things to say. Um, one I, I learned from a colleague this. I didn't invent this, but I absolutely love it. In the city, what you do to your trees, you do to me. We own the canopy. And that's why we can regulate it. The other thing I want to say is that in, in a studio that's related and is consistent time-wise with our work on the tidal basin, which is about sea level rise, I taught a studio in eastern shore of Virginia where um, the, the, the sea level rise is at five millimeters a year. So it's more than twice what it is typically around the world. And uh, this is a community of fishermen and farmers who are absolutely in denial about it. They see that their islands are eroding away and they are migrating upland. They just think it's erosion. And this is really a problem, right? The, the specific point is that in Virginia law, as your land becomes inundated, you no longer own it. What are we gonna do about that? We have a, an English land tenure system that does not correspond well with the fact that some of my land is disappearing. So I shouldn't be paying taxes on land I can't use, right? So there are a, a, a whole set of issues around land tenure that we are going to be facing in coastal situations all over. Back to the um, issue uh, before, though. <clears throat> um, Uh, in, in our work with the city of Cambridge, uh, we're now in the second phase of this. We're looking at the canopy because it is one of the extreme factors in climate vulnerability. And what we found through very important data examination with um, LIDAR, very good LIDAR information, is that the city had lost 14% of its canopy in a decade. I know you're going to lose a very big set of your 270,000 American elms here in some few years. <clears throat> some, of the loss, some of the loss and some of the um, voids in the canopy in Cambridge coincide directly with underserved populations and in increased density. How do we fix that? There's a justice question there, right? And so we don't know the answer to that yet. We have speculated that the way we would fix that would be to reprioritize the streets there, take some of the streets, some of the parking away, widen the sidewalks and get enough room for canopy, manage soils, and so on. That's not going to be easy. Turn streets into one-way streets so that we can get more planting area. Uh, you know, this is going to take a generation to do, but if we're going to solve the urban heat island problem in dense parts of the city where there is no canopy, how else are we going to do it? We have to do it that way. So I appreciate your question a lot. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, my question is about um, speculation under capitalism. Um, and I ask it in really deep appreciation of the work, um, but also in a kind of friendly attempt to try to poke at the question of the double life uh, that you live between your practice and your teaching, and, and really how double that can be um, at the end of the day. Um, and and it, it relies on, it rests on a kind of different understanding of the word speculation um, that comes out of land speculation, uh, which you know, relies on um, the enclosing of land and then the, the kind of leveraging of um, systems of capitalism to dispose of it, often fraudulently, uh, to private ownership, um, and then to, to make capital on that, to, to, to make profit on it. Um, much of the state of Florida, um, for example, was disposed of in that manner to private owners. Um, and so the, the question is how much of the speculation, how, how do you push students out of, so I might ask in terms of your own work, like can you do the, the Boston project without the tower, without GD Gates Tower, does it require the tower in order to, to work? And once the tower is there, is it really working? Um, can you, um, how can you on the one hand be looking at how to mitigate flooding in Washington DC, but also be developing 20 square blocks in, in Tampa, which um, right would be bought and then flooded and then bailed out and then flooded again and then bailed out again before eventually the entire city is uh, you know uninhabitable. So those are I'm sure questions you grapple with. How do you get students to speculate outside of um, this kind of all-encompassing known system of um, kind of capitalist space production? Uh, how do you get them to think differently? Things like moving inland from the capital, right? Which sure. probably is not going to be one of the suggestions on the board. It, it, will, it will be. Oh, good. Okay. Go. It will be. Um, well, I, I, I think, um, first of all, uh, your question acknowledges that there are, uh, to put it kindly, tensions in working in this manner, right? And working for capitalists and capitalists and colonialist institutions, and then the man in the street. Um, there, are, there, there are lots of conflicts in this, I, I, I have to admit that. Um, Ta Tampa's new streets will not be underwater. We took an engineer's plan and regraded it, first thing we did. And they said, what are you doing? We're about to build that. And we said, well, if you do, here's what it's gonna look like. It's going to be underwater. We regraded it. And so for a very long time, those streets will be dry. And we've designed those streets for massive amount of water uptake in a half an hour, because that's the kind of rainfall they have in Tampa. It rains every day for an hour or two. And every day is a 50-year storm. Uh, so we have to take account of that. I'm not, I don't struggle too hard with um, the differences um, between working for you know, highly profitable, extremely well-funded capitalists and um, working for the Franklin Park Coalition. These are both real people in my world with real assets, real um, problems, and I think we can be helpful to them. I don't hide any of that from the students, none of that. I mean, the students have to know about that. And so, you know, in every, in every studio situation, I will have Jesse Keenan or Gerald Caden come in and talk about the reality of neoliberal um, forces that are on the city, or I will have them read in, the, you know, Harper's Magazine or um, The Atlantic, because um, they have to understand those dynamics. And then I'll allow them to be utopic. But they have to be utopic with the knowledge that when they're facing that work in another situation, another real situation, the variables will be different. But I'm, I, 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 I see this conflict as something that energizes us, not that we'll solve, but that um, kind of motivates us, depending on where we're working. We have time for one more last question. Thank you, Dietmar. Um, my question has 
to do with the use of fields in the design studio. Um, and, and really, uh, you, you talk about an arbitrariness of the fields, and it, it almost seemed in what you showed that it was a generating a pattern, and the pattern was being applied. So the field is operating, okay? But do you, do you ever work from the other way that the, the landscape operates to create the field? There, and that then moves forward. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, that, that's appealing to me. I haven't pursued it as such. I think, Richard, I, am, I getting, am I getting you if I say that um, there is a landscape there and we should um, allow it to act? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because. Reading informs what feeling. Yes, that's right. No, I, 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 believe, I believe deeply that that also happens. I, I, can, I can give you a really great example. In my um, studio on the Eastern Shore, we discovered through reading, uh, well, first of all, from a, 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 a workshop with a coastal geologist, that there are something called Carolina Bays uh, in the land formation that run from Delaware all the way to northern South Carolina. There are about 13 theories about why these are formed. There are some of them the size of this room, some of them are the size of this campus. They are ellipses, and the edges of the ellipses are, um, are high, they're ridges. In the middle of them, they generally are wetlands. And if you look at you know, what I like to call an x-ray, when we take a digital environmental model, the DEM, and we put it at a certain uh, kind of transparency with a mostly transparent aerial photograph, you start to read uh, something we might call geological determinism. So in other words, settlement patterns have found the ridges in places and ignored them in others. And I think we discovered the principle that the field condition that you could depend on is geological, right? and some people like to call that geological determinism. Um, I would say that in Franklin Park, my team in, in Boston has made a discovery through a very similar thing. You know, we, we read Olmsted's notes on Franklin Park, you read the park reports during the construction of the park, and you know innately that there's a relationship between surface geology and Olmsted's um, drawing of the plan. And one of the reasons I made that remark about tools earlier and on, on uh, yesterday morning was that Olmsted didn't have the tools to realize what we realized in the office, which is that <clears throat> we're working in a Drumlin field, which had been modified by eskers, and which had you know rivers running through it for probably hundreds of years. And when you look at the surface geology drainage pattern in a kind of x-ray way, you can see that Franklin Park is a series of ridges and valleys. And then if you overlay Olmsted's circulation plan, you figure out that he knew it. Now, I've been looking at Franklin Park for 40 years, and no one has ever described that to me. But through the possibility of drawing the field condition of the geology and overlaying the system of circulation, we made a discovery. And we're working on that. Yeah. So thank you very much. Okay, I you're think welcome. because there's a reality. You don't want to miss your flight. Right. But I, I would love to speculate what would happen, what could we do together if you would miss your flight. Do you want to take a risk? He sounds dangerous. I'm, I'm now feeling very risk averse. Okay, so if I miss this flight, I can't get home tonight. Thank so. you very much. Yeah. Thank you.